I'm not live now, am I? <laughs> <laughs> you are indeed. That's us. Can We're you, live. Can you, tell, to... can you tell I'm not used to these things? I'm just trying to work out why my video is not starting. It was working two minutes ago. There we go. There's the first mistake of the evening. Um, so hello, folks. Welcome to uh, YouTube. Hopefully everything is working as it should be now. Uh, although goodness knows one can never quite me. tell. Mm. Well, you're, he you're here. I am. You're here. I'm here. We're live. It's on YouTube. It seems to... You're live. Uh, I'm no. live. I'm, I, I'm not going to look at YouTube because that really confused me trying to look at YouTube and Zoom at the same <laughs> time while we were testing, so... Very easily confused, I'm afraid. Uh, well, I accidentally had two windows open at the same time there, so that caused me even more confusion. I just had a, a what do you call this, one, an echo chamber. It literally had you echoing back down to me of what you said a minute ago. Um, so, folks, you, th th this is Cinepunk in the grip of Hammer. Um, so this is a conversation with myself and David, and we'll get around to introductions in a Hi. second. Um, all about our shared love of Hammer films, really. Mm -hmm. um, so the way this is going to work tonight, it's going to be fairly informal. This is the first in a series of conversations that I hope to be having through Cinepunk um, with other fans and, and film fanatics and, and collectors and stuff. Um, it's reasonably informal. We're going to talk a bit about ourselves and our own interests. We're going to talk about the films that we love. And you guys can contribute as well, which is hopefully you're, you're up for. Um, what we'll basically do, you've got the, you can definitely see me, says Penny, so that's good. Um, so I'll keep an eye on the live chat over on our YouTube page. And basically you can add your comments in there. Um, obviously, you know all the ground rules about being respectful and sensible and all the rest of it. And you're a lovely lot, so I can't imagine we're going to Does this apply problems. to me? Um, yes, David, it applies to you. Or can I don't, just tr treat you how I would normally? Just oh, don't troll me okay. massively this time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and, and hopefully, look, you know, um, hopefully this is of interest to folks. Um, this is a bit of a test run for me and for our format. Mm. Um, David and I have been having a chat about some other stuff, which we'll get into a bit later on. Um, so this may not be the last you hear from us. Um, I know some of you are very pleased to hear that. One or two of you may not be so pleased, but we'll see how we get along. Um, so my name's Robert J.E. Simpson. Uh, I'm the host of Cinepunked, and uh, on uh, Twitter, you'll find me as Avalard, if you've been following me for years. Uh, more recently, you may have seen my account as Exclusive PhD, which I originally set up um, when I was doing a PhD project all about exclusive films, the sister company of Hammer and Hammer's early history. I've reactivated it under David's encouragement, which has sort of indirectly led us here tonight. Now, mm -hmm. David L. Rattigan, friend, uh, tell us about yourself. I, I think we should have introduced one another. Um, oh. You know, it'd be interesting to see how we perceive one another. And I have to say, Robert, you are, to me, you are the, the golden voice of the Northern Irish airwaves. Oh, and I got this, um, I'm not used to doing these live events, but I got this thing, which looks expensive, but it's really not. It's quite a cheap mic. Um, and I was hoping it would transform my voice into a sort of, northern irish brogue but it's it's not doing it so i'm sorry okay um my name's david l radigan that's actually a pen name some of you will know me off facebook as david Kernick. that's my real name and um and i've been i've been obsessed with hammer for years and and ever since i was a kid as probably most of you have and um and rob and i have been working together for about well 10 10 over 10 years over now. 10 years yeah well over 10 years in fact about 12 13 years now uh, since we worked on Diabolique together, and then over the years, post Diabolic, Diabolique, oh, he's got a, yeah. I've got a prop. I've, I've got a couple of props tonight, David, just to make things a little easier. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and then I've sort of been a quote unquote consultant to Avalard Publishing for a few years, which basically means I'm I'm a bit of a what do you call it a bounce bouncing board is that the i i always describe people like that ideas. like that it, it, it's a it's a wall for me to bounce ideas off but mm. you know you're a sounding board that's the a one. sounding board that's bouncing bouncing that's off a brick i'm a wall. trampoline I, i'm a trampoline um and then of course just last summer I, I was at a bit of a loose end in my spare time so i thought why not start hammer gothic to finally share all this knowledge of hammer i've been building up and in fact a lot of that knowledge that i share is not really is is not necessarily knowledge that i've accumulated over the years it's research i do day by day i'm always digging into the films digging into the books um digging into the original materials whatever i can find online 
um, and that's where I get inspiration from. So, um, so yes, I, I took young Robert under my wing, and uh, he is young Robert because uh, I am younger than you. <laughs> because I'm uh, I'm I'm forty forty something, and Robert, are you only you're only about forty? Am I allowed I'm, to say I'm, yeah, you're no, younger I, than me? I'm, I'm I'm I I turned forty last year, so yes, oh, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm only I'm only forty. Um, so I've encouraged Robert to get the dust off his old. Um, PhD research and start sharing some of that stuff about Hammer and exclusive and you know, that it's, sort of it's stuff. Such a weird thing to be called young Robert because I mean I still feel young in many ways. But when I started doing Hammer stuff online, like my mm. first website on Hammer, I started when I was eighteen, and I remember like I, I did first bit of TV and stuff not long after. And I, you know when I started doing my Hammer site back then, mm. I had people who assumed I was a lot older. And then they'd meet me and they go, but you're but a child. <laughs> so I, you, you don't look like the photo you sent me. No. And, and I mean, I did that for, so for people who, who may or may not remember me from, from way back, cause I didn't really talk about my hammer stuff. Um, I used to do a website and then I ended up doing hammers official website as well. So I had this weird period where I was doing the unofficial hammerfilms.com and also hammerfilms.com. And I got them onto social media. So their Twitter and their Facebook and their YouTube and their MySpace, which ended up being quite a useful, that ended up being quite a useful thing to, to do. But I got them on all those places. It was that awful piece, that, um, that, Beyond lovely, the rave. that lovely film, <laughs> Beyond the Rave, if you recall. I don't remember. I don't know how many of you watched it, but Beyond the Rave was released in parts to YouTube. Uh, sorry to MySpace. Yeah, um, so I, I, I do remember I was, watching it. It wasn't very good. I no, well, I, and I wasn't involved in that, but I always thought it was rather amusing that it was the first site I think I'd recommended they get on, and and I I sort of insisted and we did, and then whenever the company got bought over, um, and I was lucky enough at that point to stay with them, doing what I was doing. Um, then we, you know, they did that production, but it was it was an interesting few years, and um, then I also. Uh, obviously, I was working for Hammer officially. I ended up working as their archivist. Um, did some stuff on on DVDs, Blu-rays. Um, did a lot of talks. Was on set for Wakewood, which was exciting to be on on set for an actual Hammer film. I have um, to say that's that's my favorite of the new Hammers. I think mine too. It's, it's Not just because really it's Irish. Sort of <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, there is that. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of drifted away after we did Diabolique. I kind of walked away from horror for a long time. So it's been nice to come back. And I, and thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Ellis has asked uh, over on uh, the live chat. He says, excuse me, ignorance, but is David's Hammer Gothic a website or a Facebook group? Uh, Hammer Gothic is uh, Twitter at Hammer Gothic. Is that Andy Ellis? Like as in our Andy? I don't know if it's our Andy or not, but it's an Andrew from, Ellis. From it Facebook. Yeah, Hi, sad. Andy. Um, yeah, I have I have actually set up a, a Facebook page, Hammer Gothic. Yeah, but it, it's not going to be as busy as the Twitter page. Um, well, let's be honest. How can you compete with some of the other Hammer groups that are already on Facebook? Do you want to go into well, it, it, up against Hammer lovers? I wouldn't I, risk I, it. <laughs> I don't want to be in the ring with Matt, so to speak. Um, uh, so yeah, so so but you, you can like the Facebook page, and and there'll be a link there to the um, Hammer Gothic uh, Twitter. And there'll be there'll be some sort of website eventually and stuff, um, just to see where things go. You know, we've got a few, as Robert already alluded to, we've got a few projects lined up, uh, and we'll see what comes of those. But yeah, uh, twitter.com slash hammergothic is the main URL. So um, just a reminder, folks, I mean, if you've got questions about Hammer stuff, feel free to ask them during this. We may not get around to answering everything or there may be something that we're, we're holding back on, either because we don't know, um, quite honestly, or it may be something that we're holding back for a project. Um, I know sometimes that David will send me a message and say, Robert, can I talk about this? And I'll have to say, no, I'm saving it for my book that I'm working on. And he then goes and publishes it anyway. Uh, <laughs> and Andy says, yes, it is our Andy. So it is Andy. Oh, Lewis. hi, Andy. Andy. <laughs> Lovely um, to see you. So yeah, so feel free to ask questions about that stuff, or you can ask about the stuff that that we're doing. If you need, if you need an authoritative answer about anything to do with Hammer or exclusive, we'd be happy to find someone who can answer that for you. Richard, so I continue, Robert. <laughs> uh, well, that, that, let us talk about the first thing that that is. Um, it's on my list of things that David has suggested we talk about. The title of this, "In the Grip of Hammer," which I think I may actually steal for the rest of this series because I quite like it, "In the Grip it's of." It's a good one. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well, what I'm going to do first is, oh, I've got, got, got this. You're going to try and share a screen, aren't you? I'm going to share a screen. This is so exciting. 
doing a live Zoom thing. Okay. Um, this is a French film poster from, what, 1966? Can you all see that? Hopefully you can see that. Dans les griffes de la momie. And it's, um, you'll recognize, those of you who are big Hammer fans, you'll recognize the graphics from The Mummy Shroud, which was so the 1966 Hammer film, the, the very last Hammer horror film to be filmed at Bray. Yes, and Robert. You're going to tell me this. This doesn't mean in the grief of the mummy. Uh, no, it doesn't. It actually means it actually means in the claws of the of the mummy, or or in the in the grasp of the mummy, mummy, or in the clutch of the mummy. Uh, but somehow in my head it became in the grip of the mummy, <laughs> uh, and it is etymologically related. Griff, uh, grief, grief, uh, grip, uh, griffin, even because the griffin's beak it's like a claw. So. Uh -huh. Uh, anyway, getting sidetracked. Don Le Griffe de la Mummy was the uh, 1966 Hammer horror film, The Mummy Shroud. And there's actually also, I'm going to stop sharing that screen now. Excellent. Hang on. How do I stop? Oh, there we go. Sorry, I'm not, not used to this technology at all. Um, there was a French author, uh, Nicolas something. I've forgotten his name. I'm sorry. Uh, but he wrote a book called um, Don Le Griffe. De la Hammer, a French book about French culture and French, the French people's um, relationship with Hammer Horror, because actually the French were among the first people in the world to take Hammer Horror seriously. Um, back when uh, lots of people in in England and America were sort of saying, "Oh, this is this is corny, this is hokey." Uh, the French, who of course were the first to lord Hitchcock as an auteur and um, and and uh, and talk really seriously about that. Sort of critically about Hitchcock mm. and um, and if, what was it called, Cahiers de Cinema, the French New Wave, Francois Truffaut, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't think I don't think they were into Hammer, but it was the French critics who first lauded Hammer as as and Terence Fisher in particular mm. as um, serious and worthy of critical discussion. Well, they, they and, love genre of cinema, which was the the great thing about them. Whereas there was a sort of poo pooing in other mm. countries. Um, Oh, absolutely. Well, we, we were talking about this, weren't we? Henri Langlois, mm -hmm. who had the Cinémathèque Française, I think. Yeah, in the, the centre of Paris, yeah. I think st still exists today. It's, it's, it right? It still exists, yeah. I, and when it's I, kind of museum? It, it's it's part museum, but also it's still they still screen stuff. I've, I've been to see multiple films there. Uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous place and a gorgeous bit of Paris, not far from the Seine. Mm -hmm. And the enthusiasm, I mean, it, I mean this, is, this is probably slightly offensive to some people but i actually preferred the atmosphere in there than i did in the bfi but i don't know why that is i think it may have been because i was on holiday <laughs> so yeah, you know well, i was in a much better frame not very life. patriotic of you i i never have been you know but. um yeah so Henri Langlois, he he believed in preserving every bit of film he could find it whether it was whether it's shit whether it was brilliant whether it was genre whether it was a bona fide classic he just wanted to preserve all this film and he got into a lot, lot of trouble with the French government I think it was tied in with all the riots of 68 and stuff um, he got into a lot of trouble because the French government wanted to come and take it all off him and tidy it all up because he was it was all a bit of a mess but I mean that was him that was his passion um, and so that he's he's very much emblematic of how the French have treated genre cinema they they just love their cinema they love the genres uh, and, and they did this with Hammer and uh, they had this Cine Fantastique magazine, which came out in the early 60s, and they discussed Hammer and all this. And then, of course, people in the UK followed as well. David Peary was one of, or Pyrie, uh, I don't know how you pronounce his name, um, really good critic. He wrote A Heritage of Horror, and that that treated Hammer pretty seriously and stuff. Uh, and then, of course, along came Robert J. Simpson, changed the face of Hammer <laughs> criticism forever. <laughs> um, oh, uh, only. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, but I'm getting off track. Uh, the yes, Don Le Griff de la Hammer was was the title of this book uh, by Nikola. It was like Stankovic or something like that. I can't, I, I can't remember offhand. Uh, and and I liked that title in the claws of Hammer because I too have been in the claws or in the grip of Hammer since I was very young. I think my first experience of Hammer was 1987. Um, let us know in the comments if you saw this. Um, early 87, BBC One, late Friday night, would have been about February, and they showed Dracula. And I, I'd already watched a couple of horror films. I watched Dr. And Jekyll, uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde with Spencer Tracy. And I was in love with gothic horror. And I saw that Dracula was coming up and I'd read the Lady Bird book, the definitive one, you know, that Bram Stoker based his novel on. 
And um, and so my dad recorded Dracula for me and I watched it. And then lo and behold, a couple of months later, the BBC did their documentary, uh, Hammer, the studio that dripped blood. And I always thought it was 50 years since the curse of Frankenstein, which of course it was coincidentally, but actually what they were trying to, sorry, 30 years since the curse of Frankenstein, but actually what they were trying to commemorate was 50 years since the re sort of reforming of mm. hammer film productions which is a bit controversial in itself because i know robert you're an absolute expert on hammer and exclusive and all the business side of things mm. and actually there's all kinds of sort of yeah there's all kinds of logistics to you know when did <laughs> hammer start when did it when did it collapse did it collapse was it still active was it not active where is you know 1947 is the is the year that's bandied around but yeah Anyway, um, the, the studio that dripped blood still for my money, the, the best Hammer documentary because it was it was really the original proper Hammer documentary, uh, and in fact Ted Newsom's Flesh and Blood relied a lot on that documentary. It reused a lot of the footage yeah. and stuff. Um, so that was my introduction, and I, I was totally in the grip of Hammer. And then they, of course, showed a series of films. They showed double bills all through that summer, yeah. nineteen eighty seven. You had, I think it was, I think I can remember the double bills, Rasputin the Mad Monk, paired with the nanny. Um, and the very first one was the evil of Frankenstein, paired with Dracula, Prince of Darkness. Uh-huh. I just, I was mesmerized. And I used to dream that I, I, I actually believed I could go to Bray Studios and and walk across Dracula's moat on his little drawbridge. Uh, and of course, I was devastated when I grew up and realized that, you know, that was a bit of cardboard and plywood that was, you know, probably knocked down uh you know within a few months of of the film but there you go so that was my introduction now tell us about yours was it was your introduction to hammer was it was it through a particularly shit film or tell I us about say it so mean this is the problem when he knows it so just just to pick up highlander 007 um says uh grip is a great title as it hints at our fanat- fanaticism whilst having a horror feel to it a la grip of the strangler oh yes um, so there we go. I just thought I'd add that one in as well. Mm. Um, I'll get my screens back up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th- I think in many respects, though, I mean, that kind of experience, that kind of inaugural uh, way of, of connecting with Hammer is something that probably a lot of the people watching this, um, and there are some people watching, which is reassuring, um, actually also would have felt. I mean, I, I remember chatting to uh, friends who, who like fell into this stuff in the 70s on late night double bills um and for me it was the 1990s they were doing the same thing on bbc2 and channel 4 and i built up a video collection very rapidly by sitting up into the small hours taping stuff off the tv um i i, I tell a couple of different versions of, of how i got into hammer um because i'm when i've thought about it i'm more conscious of having seen several titles a bit younger like i i know that i saw one million years bc lost continent on tv um, Hound of the Baskervilles, I'd seen a couple of times before I got round to like consciously going out of my way to see it, which I didn't realize till I watched it. And then it was like, it had this familiarity that it's like, why is this familiar? Because I've seen it. Um, but for me, the film that I, I always credit is, is one that is not loved by all Hammer fans. It is The Scars of Dracula, which, um, and there's, there, there's an old Channel 4 documentary that I did when I was very, very young. Um, and I tell the story there. I was visiting my grandmother and there was a pile of, of tapes and one of them was marked Scars of Dracula. I was going through a lot of the stuff that was there. I stuck it on and fell in love with it from the opening titles. You know, I, I, I love the, the, I mean, for me, I must have been about 11 maybe slightly younger and the blood and the, the the sexy people all kind of like came together i mean it's exactly what dracula was doing in 1958 for uh, for audiences then I, you know i just happened to be a little bit younger this was the one that i happened to see first i had nothing to compare it to so i was never bothered that it wasn't as good as say brides of dracula um it just worked for me and also i thought christopher lee and patrick triton together were were rather brilliant i mean pat triton's an actor i love and I was just sort of discovering him at that point. But that 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 kind of suckered me in. And um, I then, then a bit like yourself, it was TV screenings. And then by the early 2000s, I started writing about it um, and, and connecting people online. Um, and that's probably where we first met was on, on the old Hammer Grips, on One List or Yahoo Grips. Yahoo, I think, yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So, I mean, the, that in itself opened up a whole other world. And then I met other people and meeting some of those people was crucial into where my research and interests ended up going because, I, I mean, I never expected to get into um, the exclusive stuff. The horror films are what everybody cares about. I mean, I, I had got a prize. I, I actually realized that for a prize, one of my school prize givens when I was about 15, 16, 16, um, I got uh, the paperback version of The Hammer Story by Marcus Hart and Alan Barnes. You know, that was what I chose for a prize for school. And I remember one of the other years I got uh, the, the complete Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, it says a lot about where my head was at at that point. I had a film club in school and we screened Dracula, Prince of Darkness as I think our first film. You know, I'm, I'm, and I have the posters. I mean, so it's not like I'm making this stuff retrospectively. It's like I, I've got the stuff there. Um, there's some comments here. So I just want to pick up on those as well. Uh, Penny says there's definitely a clear generation. It's Penny Goodman. Um, says there's definitely a clear generation of Hammer fans who first encountered them on these late night BBC Two double bills. Myself amongst them. Mm-hmm. See, we're all amongst good company here. Uh, Highlander 007 says got into the Hammer in the early 70s before I saw most of the films salivating over Monster Mag. And um, mm-hmm. then I, I've been ridiculed for liking Scars, but I was a kid, so I've been given a, a bye. <laughs> and uh, Penny says, "Gotta love a man who's proud to say he loves Scars." Speak your truth. <laughs> so thanks, Penny. You now go with my favorite. This it is week. absolute, absolutely <laughs> shameless. Well, I, I see. I find Scars I- interesting. I, I know it. I mean, I don't. I think it's like you don't find it interesting at all, David. Well, <laughs> well, no, I find it interesting for not being interesting. Um, because honestly, I, I I don't rate it at all. I just think it's really dull. But some of the things um, about it, for example, and we were discussing this a bit before, and it's just a bit of a, a hammer tangent that we can can go off on. Mm-hmm. Um, it was scripted by John Elder, which which of course was the pseudonym of Anthony Hines, who was son of William Hines, aka Will Hammer, mm-hmm. who was the founder of Hammer Films. Um, so it was very much family business, a hammer yeah. and and exclusive. Now Anthony Hines, he was producer, and and if you see pictures of him, and in fact uh, I'm going to see if I can share a picture of him now. Most pictures that you see of him, you will see him like this. You'll see him carrying around a briefcase, or or with his file or folder open, or writing something in a notepad, mm-hmm. or looking looking a little bit stiff because he was very much a or certainly he's perceived as a bit of a, a figures man, uh, you know, numbers and stuff. And uh, he did a fantastic job, but he also was, he was genuinely creative. Mm. And, uh, and he wrote a lot of the, um, the hammer horrors in the, in the late, well, I guess beginning in the sixties, sort of curse of the werewolf uh, and that sort of thing under the name, John Elder, which of course I, I think I'm right in saying was an homage to James Elder, the exclusive, I, I'm guessing that's, was it a conscious homage to uh, James Elder? Um, quite possibly. If if I've ever known that, David, I have forgotten it, and it oh, hasn't. Really? I, it I has. Thought, it I also hasn't come up while I've been doing my exclusive book, so I I've possibly just forgotten it entirely. Well, then, of course, in another interesting bit of trivia, of course, uh, Michael Carreras, Henry who Younger, is a really bad um, <laughs> director and writer, but a brilliant producer. Um, yeah, he he adopted the name Henry Younger just to you know I guess get one up on on John Elder, aka Anthony Hines. <laughs> anyway, the thing is. Uh, Anthony Hines didn't really like where the company was going in, I guess, the late 60s. Mm. Um, and he left the company. But they... Uh, see, thing is, he used to write the scripts as, I think, I get the impression, as a sort of cost-cutting exercise. Should I get rid of that screen mm. share now? Because you've seen enough of, yeah, yeah. of Hines. As a cost-cutting exercise, because I don't think he got paid for them. He just did it. He just considered it part of his role. And then they didn't have to pay a script writer. And... He had some very good ideas and good concepts and came up with some good stories, mm. but his dialogue could be atrocious. Um, and, and, and you came up, he came up with some really awkward scenes. I mean, like, for example, like I love Frankenstein created woman. I love the concepts and the ideas and the general contours of the story. I don't even mind that Frankenstein isn't in it that much. Well, apparently that's what people tell me. I've never noticed that he isn't in it that much. To me, he feels like a central character. Mm-hmm. Anyway, it, it, it's a great story and great ideas, but then you get it's you get this slightly awkward dialogue when you have these, uh, you, you know, these young men, these young gentlemen in the cafe, uh, and, and the dialogue's really bad and it's all a bit cheesy. And then you find that when he ever, whenever he tries to write something a bit lighter, it's kind of embarrassingly bad, like the... You know the the wagoner 
who's who's dubbed by Michael Ripper in Rasputin the Mad Monk. Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh yeah, I could go to the city and the oh the walls are tall as oh and the roads are paved with oh and it's just crap dialogue. And this is what I noticed about Scars of Dracula. There's that awful scene with the policeman, mm. uh, the two policemen, and uh, poor Anthony Hines can't think you know, what should the policeman say, so he just has the one policeman repeating what the other policeman says all the time, and it's it's really unfunny. And then you've got this carry on scene with uh, I've forgotten the actress's name, but there's there's also Bob Todd, is it from Benny Hill, uh, and it's it's like something from a carry on film, and it's so badly written and badly executed. And I just wonder why, if Anthony Hines has, had left the company uh-huh. and they didn't need to hire him, why they kept hiring him? I I, I don't know if you have an answer to that. I, I mean, it's an interesting one because I, I've been going back through some some old research notes uh, about it recently, and what always strikes me is that Tony Hines was involved in the company far later than he ever gets credit for. You know, generally it's kind of, you know, he he, he sells up, you know, he, he goes away and ends up being a Carreras company, but he is still writing scripts. And also, Hammer, the Carreras were still leasing Hammer House off him as their offices. I mean, he was still the landlord, which yeah. I love. I mean, I love that actually, you know, as late as the, you know, the, the, the late 70s, the Heinzes are still, you know, having some control over their brand. Um, I don't know. I guess there's probably a lot of loyalty. I mean, I think the Carreras and the Hines were were pretty fond of each other. I think Michael was was fond of Tony. I don't think there was there's any doubt there. Um, and the same with Jimmy Saxon. I mean, they were like a nice little triumvirate. And I get the impression that 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 loyalty counted for a lot because when Michael Carreras took over, I mean, he was shafted by his father. Um, he was shafted mm-hmm. by the industry. I mean, he found it very difficult to make stuff happen. Um. And I guess so sad at the end. Yeah. I mean, I guess that the, the the thing is when, I mean, Tony. The, the interviews I've seen with Tony, he can be quite dismissive of some of the importance of it, and I think that's just him being a, a, a rather. My impression is that he's just quite a, a sort of a shy and 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 sort of, um, you know, he, he he's not the 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 showman that, that Jimmy Carreras is, you know, mm. it's not all about him. Um, but I think it must have, I think the company still must have meant something to him. Um, and I think it still means something to the family, uh, even today. So I, I don't have a straight answer. Um, Another interesting thing, just while we're talking about scars, because the other interesting thing is just how I, I think it just looks terribly cheap and, and bad and it's badly lit. Now the cameraman was was Maury Grant, and I've been fortunate to bump into the granddaughter of of, of Maury Grant on Twitter, and um, she shared a few photos and, and such of her of her of her grandfather, who was um, he was he was rated very highly as a as a cameraman, as a literally the camera operator, not cinematographer, and he did that for years for Hammer, an exclusive like back in the forties. Um, and he was rated so highly that he was regular cameraman for Val Guest, who directed Quite a Mass Experiment, that sort mm. of stuff. Yeah. And um, and and Val Guest, you know, requested him specifically because he was so good. But um, then I, I can't remember where I was reading this, but I was reading about Maury Grant when he got later on in his career a few opportunities to become DP, director of photography and mm. cinematographer. And one of these was on Scars of Dracula, and and, and people commented that. He, he was really he had quite a crisis of confidence right uh, in his own skills and and I, and I think that shows through it, it's very scars is very it's very flat looking yeah it's very it's very overlit and the sets yeah. look terrible now i know i know scott mcgregor who was an excellent set designer i mean he did taste the blood of dracula which just looks stunning hmm. um I, he did a few others uh, for hammer it sort of replaced bernard robinson but then like bernard robinson died quite young as well so yeah um I'm not sure it was Scott McGregor's fault because now there's a clip of a, maybe a, like an ITV documentary or something filmed on the set of Horror of Frankenstein, which mm. used the same sets as Scars of Dracula. But it was in black and white. And actually, those castle sets don't look too bad in black and white. No, so I do I, wonder, I do I, wonder if it was how it was filmed. Now, Maury Grant, he did, he did Hands of the Ripper, which I didn't think looked too bad, and, and uh, Vampire Circus, which looked pretty good. But, um, well, I also think this is part of the yeah. reason why I fell for the film because when I saw, I saw on a on a on a VHS, mm. um, and it 
hadn't gone through any kind of remastering process. I mean, this was, you know, those VHSs in the, the 80s and 90s um, tended to come from sort of prints that, that looked darker. They were rougher. There was, there was something else going on. And I'm not sure it was quite as crisp as what we get off the, the current Blu-ray. And I, th- I mean, like for me, when I watch a lot of those old Hammer films, I find it quite odd to see them pristine now because that wasn't how i experienced them they were grittier they were darker they were um more textured um so i i mean i think that's part of it but the, the alchemy that's at play that that makes the hammer films either great or not great is, is so complicated uh, i mean yes definitely it's overlit as are a number of films in the 70s that that go hammer's way um Obviously, the loss of Bernard Robinson was was awful for the company. Um, I mean, he had a not just a a way of designing and building, but I mean his his sense of economy, his sense of style, all went. Um, and then they, obviously they moved to a bigger studio space too, which I think also impacted how the, how they did stuff. Um, I just want to well, pick I mean, up again I, I on some went... more of the chats. Um, so, Eamon McGuinness. Uh, so Holger Holger Haas, who we, who we know and love, don't let don't let Holger speak. Uh, says he recently rewatched uh, Scars of Dracula, and, and he he's risking to say he enjoyed it more than in previous times. So excellent, Holger. Uh, You're Emma, right, Holger. Emma McGuinness says key folk for him were Alan Frank and Des Skin. Not literally Hammer folk, but their books and magazines made such an impact mm-hmm. on my fertile young mind before I actually got to see anything on screen. Um, and I, I, I think yeah, absolutely, you have to shout out to Alan Frank and Des Skin. I mean, for me, it was people like Mike Murphy, Wayne Kinsey, and Richard Clemenson. You know, I, when I discovered their magazines, it was such an eye opener. And then obviously, you know, the official stuff as well. Um, Hal Sinden says he'd be interested to know whether there would be a would we would be derision now about family dynasties having such influence over an entire production house in that way, um, which is an interesting question and one maybe we should come back to in a in a conversation mm-hmm. about the the Heinzes and the Carreras's. Um, my my gut feeling is that possibly, but I think those things still exist. Um, let me see. Brandon Gant says Scars is such a bland film. I remember viewing it on DVD years back and being totally underwhelmed. Such a lazy production all around, and it's really the odd man out of those Draculas. Um, <laughs> and Hal says, uh, Hammer, honestly, one of the reasons I've not invested in Blu ray player, I'm not sure I want to see them in soap opera vision. <laughs> mm. Highlander 007 says, I saw Scars in my late 20s. I was so excited, and then I saw it. Right, we're going to move on from Scars Dracula. Otherwise, we'll get caught up in a, in a, a Scars bit. And, and I know only because like, only because Matt chimed in. And if you get Matt going on Scars of Dracula, <laughs> holy shit, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh, is that who Highlander well, 007 is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that Matt? Ah, I missed that. So I don't want to, you know. Uh, and by the way, I I just want to say from my point of view, I do I, I do rib Robert all the time for liking Scars of Dracula. Um, I, I do think it's a terrible film, and I think. I mean, it's like, you know, on, on Twitter, Judy Jarvis, who was known as Judy Matheson on the screen, she mm. was in Twins of Evil and she was in Lust for a Vampire as well. And and she's she's always saying what a fine film she she thinks it's she thinks Lust for a Vampire was. And I feel terrible, you know, saying to her, I, I really don't rate it at all. I, th- I think it's awful. Um, and she's a lovely lady and I feel guilty for, you know, disagreeing. But honestly, my my opinion is that, I mean, we all find different things in different films. I mean, sometimes these films have a connection with us just because maybe because of the time we first saw it, mm-hmm. maybe because of who we saw it with, maybe because of who's in it, even if it's a bunch of crap. Um, I mean, like, you know, one of the things that often gets mentioned about Scars, I'll shut up about Scars in a minute. But <laughs> I don't have any affinity with, with Patrick Troughton because I'm not Hoovian. Uh-huh. You know, he's a good actor in some things, but I don't, I, I really don't rate his performance in that. And I know people always say well, how wonderful he is. Oh, I'm just going to find the, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna find the boot but, button here and get you off the screen. But, <laughs> but I think it does come down to, you know, associations. And I think a lot of questions about hammer horror and stuff. And like one of the questions is, what is a hammer horror? Mm. For example, like to me, Rasputin the Mad Monk is a hammer horror. The Devil Ship Pirates is a hammer horror. And it's just because it has Christopher Lee in it. And, you know, they throw in a bit of blood because it's got to be Hammer Horror. Yeah. You know, Captain Clegg, 
you know, they threw in a few gothic elements. And probably if it had been made by any other studio with any other cast in any place other than Bray, you'd probably just say, oh, that's, you know, that's a, a pirate drama or an adventure or whatever. But it's got all the ingredients I love about Hammer Horror. So to mm. me, it's Hammer Horror through and through. So, yeah, it's kind of weird how, well, how genre works like that. On, on the note of, of of taste, I mean, because this is going out as a Cinepunked uh, live, I should say for anyone who, who follows the stuff we do with Cinepunked, I mean, we have, there is literally nothing that we don't think is worth covering at some point. Um, you know, everyone has their own tastes and, and film and art is all very, very subjective. So whatever it is that works for you, I've, I've no complaints. I mean, we could easily, there was a conversation the other day about On the Buses again, um, which is another series that's similarly reviled by certain groups of, of Hammer fans, but it has its place. And to not acknowledge that and to, to, to sort of to say, like, I never want to be a gatekeeper when it comes to this stuff. I never want to say to somebody, oh my gosh, your favourite Hammer film is, well, someone's just mentioned Lust for a Vampire, is Lust for a Vampire, therefore I can never talk to you. You know, that's a film that you've 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 gelled with, so that's great. You know, I mean, something has worked for you, and if it's extended to the point where you get into these films and explore them, or it makes you explore some other film entirely, um, that is, for me, a very positive thing. I mean, that's Th th these conversations are also about fandom and i think that's for me the essence of fandom it's it's mm. about finding your tribe and and uh finding the things that that just make you happy yeah I, 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 am, I, 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 am I, mean, I preaching you know <laughs> um you know full disclosure i mean i'm a fan of the witches 1966 mm. film i don't like i don't <clears> particularly <throat> like john joan fontaine in it but Kay walsh is just divine and uh, I, I love that film and I find it really watchable and really suspenseful and I love everything about it. And it's just one of those that's it's kind of like Marmite to, to Hammer fans. Some people really loathe it and find it really boring. And actually we've had, Robert, you and I, our, our friendship has really been tested recently because there's been a few Hammer films that have come up and you said, actually, I, I don't really like that. And, well, uh, the, have, the, witches, have, the Witches is one of them. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I, I, have, I have seriously reconsidered whether I want to know you or whether I should just quit live on air. But so, I mean, I, so. I, I, I think part of the thing for me is that, I mean, we've talked a bit about this before. Whenever people talk about Hammer, so much of it gets focused on the gothic horrors. Mm -hmm. And I find for me, um, I find there's slightly less scope for exploring because there's been so much written about them. There's so many conversations about them and we all love them. I mean, I like I am incredibly fond of Hammer's gothic horrors. I, I, you know, what I've written about them, I've gushed with praise for what I like. Um, but Hammer has also become this sort of weird obsessive treasure hunt, and I like finding the treasure. And the treasure is often not in the horror stuff; it's in the other things. That's where there's still stuff that hasn't been seen. Where you know, and it, I, I mean, I'm quite relieved now to see there's there's other podcasts and stuff that have been coming out. There's other fans that are coming out of the woodworks now as more stuff is becoming accessible. And I mean, I I, I love the idea that there's this group that are currently working their way through as many of the Hammer films that they can, and they've started mm. with the exclusive stuff. You know, that's what I like. For me, twenty years ago when I started getting into this, they would have been my people. Um, I'm not saying you're not my people, but you know we we haven't had a, we haven't had dinner yet. Um, You've drawn a line in the sand here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but it's it's just that thing. I mean, like yeah. there's there's a disconnect. I mean, you know, I I I'm that would have made me so excited. But that was a, a point where we, I remember in those old hammer grips, it used to be a struggle to get people to talk about anything that wasn't Frankenstein or Dracula. You know, that wasn't Peter Cushing or Christopher Lee. Any conversation at all just wouldn't go there. And it's such a shame because that is a huge, huge body of work. I I, I enjoy that stuff. We've talked about it um, as kind of being like the, the sort of side roads and byways of, of Hammer Horror. And as long as I can see the connection, the thread that takes it back to Hammer Horror, which is like my first love then I really enjoy exploring those those little side roads. Now, I have a lot a lot of those early Hammer films and exclusive mm. films I haven't seen, uh, and it's a, a lot of them are sort of on, on my watch list for this year. Yeah. Um, I, but you do, you do find some real gems in there. I mean, I, I watched, uh, just in the past year, I watched Man in Black for the first time. Uh, heresy to admit that, because I know that's one of your, your favourite yeah. um, exclusive slash Hammer films. Um, and it was a really neat little thriller. It was, uh, uh, but I think part of why I enjoy it is because 
you can see the thread to Hammer Horror, the fact it was filmed mm-hmm. in Oakley Court. It was all, almost all filmed inside Oakley Court and you could recognise bits and, you know, there was a sense of history and of continuity with the Hammer Horrors there. Uh, and that was my way into it. Um, and, and then and then The Man in Black will then be my way into other mm-hmm. um, exclusive films that were, sh- that were shot. All, all, that all the Sid James sort of exclusive films. Um, uh, he's, he's quite a good straight actor, actually. He's brilliant. I mean, That's, like... The hit, the, the scene where he's hypnotized is yeah. is i think he's really effective yeah i think he's a bit, it's a bit of a revelation i'm just going to pick up on some of the, the comments again because mm-hmm. we've got some here um holger has uh, Matt, matt's given us grief uh, he says raise the bar um we, we will matt we're, we're getting to tell this uh-huh. well. uh but holger has pointed out it wasn't on the buses hammer's financially most successful film at the time i went and did some it figures for for david last week about this on twitter uh, going through a bunch of what were the most expensive films, um, and on the bus obviously was cheap as chips, but it was it was hugely profitable for them. Mm. Um, Penny says it seems to me that Hammer were deliberately playing on their reputation and responding to audience expectations with things like Captain Clegg, like including the skeletal mm. horses early yeah, on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, because it's not a it's not really a horror film, but it feels like it should be from the posters. Mm. Uh, and he's quite pleased because he says, yay, someone else who likes the witches. Brandon Gant also loves the witches. So you've got lots of friends tonight, David. Yeah, I, I find a lot of people <laughs> online who like it. But it, it is the, it's the Marmite thing. If they, uh, when people don't like it, they really don't like it. Matt, Matt says the witches is very interesting, but could have been so much better. I'm probably siding with Matt on that one. Uh, and Penny also says, agrees with me about gatekeeping. It seems to me stupid to push each other away when we're a small community of fans in the first place. Uh, hugely important. I mean, like Dave and I have, have conversations a lot about how we want to sort of interact with people. And like, there's no way either of us wants to shut off other fans from, from accessing this stuff. I mean, everyone who comes into this, we find it with new fans who've just discovered something for the first time and have seen their first couple of films but really are quite lost. And it's so easy at that point to kind of go, oh, for goodness sake, you know, you, you don't know what's going on, just go away. Or you could be like a sensible person and go, there's someone who's just discovering this stuff. How great would it be to be that person again to find these films for the first time? The first time you watch a Hammer film on a big screen is like a pleasure. Like, oh, absolutely. I, I remember, obviously, I being... Still, I mean, older than you, Robert, but mm. still fairly young. The first one I saw on the big screen was 2007 when Dracula re-released, uh, sorry, BFI re-released Dracula and re- uh, newly restored. And I think it was at Halloween 2007. And it was the first time I'd ever gotten to see a Hammer Horror on the big screen. And I was literally on the edge of my seat. And it was a weird experience because there weren't many people in the theatre there were a few young people in the theater who thought it was all hilarious. Mm. I, I mean, to be honest, I, I mean, I could understand maybe if they were watching other films that I couldn't net that I won't name because we don't want to go back there, but there's certain other films that I could understand the kids today laughing at, uh, but actually I, th- I think uh, Dracula 1958 still holds up quite well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they, they, they found various bits quite hilarious, um, but I just kind of ignored them and got into it. And by the end of the film, I was literally on the edge of my seat. It was just an amazing cinematic experience. What? It's one of those films I, I really would absolutely love to go back and be in the audience that first time. Because I think there are a lot of surprises with that film that we find really hard to appreciate today. Well, I think actually the humour is, is something that's, that's maybe lost until you're in the group environment. Because like for years, my experience of Hammer films was watching them at home on a TV set. Mm. And then when you go into a theatre, now even in, in even if we were at a Don Fernie event in the Cine, Cinema Lumiere in, in, in Kensington, you know, mm. if we're, we're, we're sitting there watching something there back in the day, like you would still get people laughing at stuff that you maybe didn't think was, was mm. the laughable moments. But you realise that actually the humour is there deliberately and it's when you're in the group that people feel that they can and they can kind of spot the ridiculousness and the gags and the the over the top routines and you realize that actually yeah the humor is there but the humor is also there to offset the horror you have to have the daft in order to get away with being horrific and that's really difficult for us to get our heads around in 2022 mm-hmm. but in 1956 57 58 64 you know this was obviously still quite testing times the the, mm-hmm. the boundaries were still being played with that's why you get something like i am legend not being made by hammer because it was just a step too far well i think by the time they came to that they just had enough of um was it john trevelyan at the bbfc and and they, they just weren't going to take any risks at all by that stage because 
he was being far too arsy. And he was when you when you read some of the stuff that the BBFC used to say oh, yeah. about his films, he, he'd he'd start he'd comment on the script like it was any of his business. Well, like, it, oh by the way, this scene is a bit you know not very good dialogue. It's like fuck off, John. I I, I don't know if you read Am I any of the, to swear on this. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you read any of the coverage around the film censor that got released last year. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that that kind of came up in the conversations about that was John Trevelyan and the way that he essentially was was basically trying to make himself a vicarious filmmaker. You know, mm. he he yeah. wanted to have that kind of influence, but rather than make films, you know, he's sitting there in his little little office. Ultimate critic. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a weird, weird situation, and and we don't have that, so it, it it's strange for us to kind of get ourselves in that mindset, and it mm. also. So the thing that we frequently forget is that these films were were being made just to entertain and to make money. That was still the object. It mm-hmm. wasn't to, to make, I don't think it was very often to make great art, although I think inadvertently along the way, um, Hammer sometimes made great art and Exclusive sometimes distributed great art. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an odd selection of films there, as well as some absolute dirge. Um but you know, each and each and no thing. Uh, mm-hmm. Matt says he saw Taste the Blood of Dracula on the big screen around 1977 and was dumbstruck. Halcyon days, indeed. I'm mm-hmm. quite envious. I don't think I've ever seen Blood of Dracula on, on a big screen. Um, that'd be quite a, quite a nice one to see. Um, th- th- that's uh, let's talk about something. Else. Let's talk about sex, David. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not pro- I'm not propositioning. Are we, are you. I just want to reassure you. Live stream then. <laughs> Well, okay. Well, this was the other thing because because when we we're talking about this this title in the grip of hammer, and we, we were having quite a conversation on Twitter the other day about um, about Dracula and and sex and sexuality, um, uh, because grip has certain connotations. Um, uh, let me let me find this picture. I think it was Matt actually who in the Hammer Lovers who might have shared this originally many years ago. I'm sure I found this picture in. Um, Right, I'm going to share it. This is Melissa Stribling at the, I think it's probably at the premiere of, there we go. Can you all see that? Mm. Uh, I think this is probably at the premiere of, of Dracula, the London premiere. Melissa Stribling, who played Mina Holmwood in Dracula. And she's grabbing this candlestick. I don't know what, I don't know what she's doing. I mean, for all I know, she might have just been like literally moving it out of the way and the, and the cameraman caught it just at the right moment uh, but i couldn't help but think of that um hilarious scene in twins of evil which is otherwise an absolutely brilliant movie it's it's pure hammer gothic it's just lovely um but there's this scene where catch a wire wanks a candle stick <laughs> and it's it's hilarious and quite ridiculous um and and i couldn't help but think of this um this image but then there's this scene, um, which you all know what scene I'm going to talk about in, in Dracula, where Mina comes in uh, from her quote unquote walk in the garden. She's actually just been to see Dracula. Mm. And of course, Terence Fisher told her, and I'm sure most hardcore Hammer fans will have heard the story. Ter- Terence Fisher told her to, um, uh, to act as if she'd just had quote unquote a whale of a night, the best, the best sex of her life. And she comes in, and the way she handles her fur coat is almost masturbatory. Mm. Uh, and in fact, I find there's a bit of the same with Lucy as well when she kind of, the way she uncovers her neck in preparation for Dracula, mm-hmm. it's a little bit masturbatory. And um, you actually made another connection with another scene, which I thought was, well, I don't know, it was interesting. What was that? Did you want to say? I- <laughs> was uh, oh, this is this the one in the in the graveyard? Yes. Where I was, I was picking up on 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 the the, the child. And uh, Cushing dressing her up, Van Helsing dressing her after she's about to be prayed victim yeah. to. Um, yeah, and she she actually funny because the funny thing is she ha- she handles the fur coat in, the, in a similar way. But there's also a, a scene where she, she does you know the way when um, Mina comes in from the garden and she's she's looking up very coyly, like very almost you know seductively or something at um, rolling her eyes at Arthur. Oh Arthur, don't fuss, and. Um, and little Janina Fay has almost the same look. I know that all sounds very creepy, but there is something a bit in the in, in the novel in, in the mm. novel Dracula. It's the bluefer lady, isn't it? And she yeah, preys yeah. upon children, yeah, yeah. and they all describe this beautiful lady. It's almost a bit sort of pre-vampire circus, isn't it? Well, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a subtext within this stuff that if you start looking into it, um, I mean, if you thought about that, those connotations and 
you consider that that was a possibility, then suddenly the film becomes rather racier than I think we generally think about it. Um, and you can see why maybe the censors were having issues with with Hammer in the direction that they were going in, because, mm-hmm. you know, that definitely is, um, you know, uh, sex and, and violence and gore. And, and yeah, there, there definitely is. I mean, that, that, that stuff resonates later on, and it's a huge part of the, the Hammer... Um, the hammer strategy is, is, is sex and violence. Um, just had some comments here. I just want to add these in as well um, mm. before we get back to the hammer and masturbatory scenes. <sighs> the things I never thought I'd say tonight. Um, Tony Sullivan says that Crater Mass in the Pit was a religious experience back in the day on the big screen, um, which is, is pretty cool. Um, I, I can see that. Uh, Im, well, it's liter- literally a, a, relig- a religious allusion, isn't it? The pit. It is, yeah. It's an Old Testament. Old Testament term for for hell. I feel we should probably Sorry, get, we should probably do a quarter mass thing at some point, since the the Nigel Neal uh, centenary stuff this year. Mm. Um, Eamon McGuinness is asking about the Lodge. Did it ever get a UK cinema or DVD release? Um, and Matt is also asking about its non appearance in the UK. Do you know what the Lodge is basically a victim of of um, from my understanding? Now, bearing in mind, I no longer have any official connection to Hammer films, um, so I don't have the privilege of knowing stuff anymore. I have to sort of mm. go by my sources and reading between the lines, um, and and sometimes it's, it's not so easy. But from what I understand, the Lodge was being lined up for release um, in the UK and and, and other territories. There was already a bit of a delay because it came out sort of starting to screen around the end of 2019 as the pandemic was just getting underway. And I think that kind of stopped it. Um, it has made its way out into Blu-ray on a number of countries. I had to buy it in from Germany uh, on Blu-ray because there just wasn't any chance of getting it. And there was, I had a friend who was going to screen it as part of a festival here in Belfast. Um in 2020 so it was definitely being touted for for distribution and screening um but pandemic just put an end to all of that and i think it's probably now got lost in that i i suspect that i mean i don't know if they're going to end up having to write it off um write off their losses or if they'll try and get it out into the cinemas it, it, i mean hammer in a weird position right now um the new company has not had the best of successes with the films that they've they've sought um unfortunately because some have been rather good um I mean, personally, I've always felt they should be doing more local stuff, you know, more more UK shop material on low budgets. But, you know, I'm not a film producer, so um, just going to pick through some of these other stuff. Uh, so Penny says, um, the restored footage of Dracula biting Mina certainly showed how sexy the whole thing was intended to be from the start. Mm. Uh, yeah, wasn't that a revelation? <laughs> um, well, then it has. Actually, I, I felt that that footage added more to the movie than than the restored ending because the mm. restored ending with all the obviously you know every hammer fan was like just drooling over that you know flaking flesh or whatever it was um but I, and you know me included mm. um but i'd have happily just had that as an extra in terms of actually watching the film and and mm. uh, the whole sense of it i, I thought the those few seconds of extra footage in Mina's seduction scene were were quite, yeah. They they really added something. They were much more exciting, um, possibly from a sort of modern perspective, a bit more problematic because there's that thing going on with the the male gaze. Oh. How you feel this relationship? You know how consensual this relationship is. Yeah. Although I don't want to get all. Do you want to talk about the gaze? On people, but. Okay. Sorry, you don't oh, talk yeah, about the gaze. The gaze. Uh, well, we can get back to that because we'll, we'll, we'll go into it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Hal says uh, there's a bunch of comments here, so I want to get through these. Uh, and Hal says, in many respects, the that open suggestion towards sexuality has really been replaced now with totally open sex scenes. Both elements have their virtues, I think. Yeah, I, do you know I watched something the other day that was really restrained in terms of sex, and I was kind of shocked, but also loved it as a result uh, uh, yeah there's, there's a whole other conversation we could have that i think we'll have to leave for another night about that one uh phil obard says yes to hal's comments isn't it widely thought that vampire stories in general are always about sex only told in a way that could get past the censors usually um yeah i think so um highlander says shame about the lodge it's brilliant the, the lodge is is well worth tracking down if you can get it uh, on a streaming service or, 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 a, or a blu-ray it may come out eventually who knows I, i've i've not seen it yet obviously because of its availability, but I have heard, and, and I think, again, this might be Matt in the Hammer Lovers, because Matt, I think you've talked about it, that, and a lot of people have said the same, 
Yeah. Which is that it's an extremely good film, extremely well done, but not one that you want to watch uh, often or, or no. ever again. <laughs> No, it's, it's quite it's quite harrowing. It's a it's a hard watch. Um but actually I think I mean it it, it, it was shot quite cheaply too in many respects. And I think it and Wake would fit quite nicely together in terms of their sense of economy. And I feel that they feel more like a hammer film, even though they don't feel like a hammer film, but they feel more hammerish than some of the other stuff that's come out. Um mm. Holger asks, uh, favorite hammer glamour star from both of us while we're on the subject. So Holger's feeding back into our, our I think our next topic. Folks, yeah. if you're happy to stick with us, we're happy to keep on chatting for a bit. Um we're about an hour in and we'd sort of said we'd do an hour, hour and a half if people were still interested. Um so if you're still interested, stick around um, and we'll carry on chatting for a bit yeah, until we, David we falls asleep. Interaction, so you know, keep asking your questions or offering your opinions and all that kind just, of stuff. Just don't offer your phone number to David because you'll be hounded. Oh. Uh, um, so, favourite Hammer Glamour? Do you have one? Well, we, well, we were discussing this because I, I've always had this... Well, I, I think in various various sections of fandom, mm. the way the sort of Hammer hammer babes are talked about in, in varying ways. And sometimes it can be very... It can get like very sort of sexist and ta- tasteless and stuff. Um, but then, of course, I, I'm talking from the perspective of, of a gay man. So, uh, you know, you can show me all the tits in the world and I'm not really going to get um, not going to get very excited in that sense. Um, <laughs> I mean, I do have Hammer Hammer actors who are, you know, who you can you would consider Hammer glamour. That, I mean, Barbara Shelley is just off the scale. Uh, and I think in, I think sometimes the, the, the acting is underrated because these, you know, like someone like Veronica Carlson, for example, um, you know, people remember she wasn't particularly busty or anything, but she she is sort of hammer glamour. Mm. Um, but it's very easy to overlook just how the depth of her performance, say in Frankenstein, must be destroyed. Which is, I think she's just brilliant in. Um, I, I think most of them are, are, are very watchable. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have this issue with the, with the hammer glamour thing. But then on the other hand, I have been known to get a little tipsy on the gin and tonic and start tweeting about Oliver Reed's nipples. So it is, you know, it does. Maybe I'm a bit of a hypocrite. <laughs> I I don't think so. I I don't think that's hypocritical. I mean, I've I've had such a weird relationship with this over the years, um, and that also I think depends on my own personal journey as to where I sit with it. Mm-hmm. You know, I've 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 gone from from sort of like the the sexual awakening that that Hammer helped contribute to. Um, to sort of my own kind of moralities and stuff developing. I mean, like it's like the stuff when I was into a teenager. You know, mm-hmm. it was a it was a weird time. And being from Northern Ireland, it's it, I mean, it's slightly different from you London folks. You know, you've, from city folk who live in a different place entirely. Um, but it was um, it was odd. I mean, I, I think about people like the Collinsons. I mean, for me, Twins of Evil is is, is always going to be my default film. Um, I, I adore that film. I think Peter Cushing's amazing in it. But the Collinson twins were absolutely captivating. And you've got Katya Wyeth in that. It, there's, there's, there is stuff there. And, there's, and, and you know, like every, every female in that is well cast. Uh, Damien Thomas is lovely too. Um, and he's a lovely fellow who's kept his age very well. Um, I, I love that. I'm very fond of Ingrid Pitt. Um, you know, and, and just to... have you ever worked with her? Do you have any books to sell? She may have, oh, I, you may have I, published. I may have published this one with her once more time, good. Dracula Who, Very which good. which was originally at one point lined up to be a Hammer production. Um, wow, and that's available from Amazon, I assume. Uh, she's, no, actually, it's not. Well, there's oh, an ebook version. Sorry. No, um, this one, Anal Domini, um, is available still. Um, yeah, we did a couple of books with Ingrid and. Uh, there might be some more English stuff happening. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure yet. There's, there's been some conversations, um, which is weird. Are you there, Ingrid? I, Sorry. I. I mean, I feel. I feel weird. I was working with Ingrid when she died. On not not immediately when she died, but I was working with her in the year or so before she died on a, a memoir about her time at Hammer. Um, and it was never completely finished. I mean, she died before she finished her bit, and I never was able to to finish my side of that. Um. So I'm very fond of her, and I mean, she was the first kind of hammer glamour that I I properly got to know. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I, I can't not mention Caroline Monroe. I know, I mean, Matt there has mentioned her in the feeds. Um, Caroline, even, 
even I have a crush on Mar- oh, Marilyn Monroe. Always say Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Caroline <laughs> Monroe. Monroe. When I when I met her, I don't go to many fan events. Yeah. Partly because well, they don't let you. To be honest, yeah, I'm banned. Um, no, to no, to be quite honest, I I just usually can't can't mm. afford to to be going away to to conventions and things like that. Uh, but I did go to seven, I think, and it was a fantastic event. Met all kinds of lovely actors, and Caroline Monroe was there. And mm. honestly, you you just meet her, you fall in love with her because she's so she's still so beautiful and so elegant and all that. But she's just an all-round lovely personality, as I'm sure, you know, all the, you know, um, Hammer actors are. I mean, I, I think if there's, I mean, I, I still remember the time I got asked to do an interview on stage and I had uh, Caroline, Martin Beswick and Ingrid Pitt. First mm-hmm. time meeting, I think, all three of them. And I had to do an interview and it was just like, I mean, it was amazing because like the kid me is just like, how am I doing this? But mm-hmm. um, my favorite Hammer Glamour images, though, um, there's a gorgeous shot of of Maddie Smith that's on the cover of the Hammer Glamour book, and mm. that image is stunning. I love the photographs that um, oh gosh Terry What's His Face did of uh, Raquel O'Neil. Welch. Terry O'Neill did of, of Raquel Welch for One Million Years BC, especially the stuff on the cross, which is just like so stunningly weirdly different. Um, I have a bunch of stills that I picked up of Marla Landy from Mask of Dust. Which are gorgeous, and Barbara Payton's photographs from Four Sided Triangle, some of the behind the scenes stuff and the, the the glamour shots they did. I love those. Marla Landy, which um, that was her in Hand of the Basketballs, wasn't it as well? Uh, it might right? well have been, yeah. Um, who I am I thinking of? That oh, I'm thinking of Mar- no, no, Norma Marla. No, what? Who was the lady in who played the Snake Woman in? Um, oh in gosh, I can't Dr. remember. Was it, it was something like Norma Mar. No, not. Marla Norman or Norman 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 Mailer, <laughs> the novelist. No, I can't remember, but I, I was reading an interesting story about that. It, it was in one of Wayne Kinsey's books because uh-huh. if, by the way, if if you're anything like me and obsessed with sort of the detail of Hammer Productions, especially at Bray and that sort of stuff, which if you follow my Twitter account, you'll know I'm obsessed with every detail of Bray Studios, much to uh, Robert's. Um, I don't know, An- annoyance, amusement, I don't know. I just want to um, say, sorry, I, I I mentioned the wrong name. I should have said Mary Alden, I think. Oh, okay, meant. okay. Yeah. Um, so the le- anyway, the, the, the story I was going to tell was that the lady who played the snake, snake dancer in Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll, she was supposed to have been trained by a Peruvian snake dancer from the Café de Paris, which is London's oldest nightclub. And, um, and this poor Peruvian girl who was saving up to to go um to to send money back to her parents or something in peru where they were very poor um she actually died a couple weeks later in a or a couple months later um as a result of you know she was killed by her python that she performed with i've been trying to find some documentary evidence of this in you mm-hmm. know newspaper archives and things i've not found it yet i've no reason to doubt the story but uh, that was quite a sad story and of course that's how the the snake dancer dies in the film as well. Mm-hmm. Or does she? Does she die? Yes, no, she no, does. That's, or is it Christopher Lee? Christopher Lee definitely no. dies that way. No, she does. She, 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 she dies too. Um, I'm just going to go back through some of these comments again because there's still loads here. Uh, Last Avenger eighty five says the Vampire Lover says one of the best openings in any Hammer film. Um, I'm trying to remember. Oh, oh it's funny, like Douglas Wilmer in the. Oh yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Andy wants to hear about you. Who, who, you, who our favorite Hammer hunks are? We'll get to that in a second. Oh. Uh, My favourite hammer hunk is Andy Ellis. <laughs> <That was, laughs> uh, Matt also asks about which hammer film we'd like to see remade and why. So we'll, that's a good question for us to get to in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, he also says that his hammer crush is Shane Bryant, no doubt. Uh, yeah, why not? Shane was—I mean, Shane's love was lovely. Um, I, I, I worked with him for a bit on a on a couple of bit projects that, that mm-hmm. ended up not happening. And uh, we bonded reasonably well over um, chat about shared university day. Went to, we both went to Trinity College Dublin for a period. Um, Shane got further than I did, and um, we used to chat. I remember waking up to seeing Shane's number on my phone. Such a weird sort of fan moment. You're like, mm. who's waking me up at this time? Oh, it's Shane Bryant. Okay, I have to answer <laughs> that. Um, you, Halson can't, in- you can't refuse. Shane. No. Uh, Halsonen says yes in fairness Ollie Reed maintained being stunning throughout his life just in different ways I could swear that his early Hammer appearances played on that knowingly um, 
Holger has got a, a, a man boner for Oliver Reed as well. Um, Brandon Gant has gone for Inger Pitt. Halson, we've got, this is the Hammer Glamour. Halson says, doesn't like Inger Pitt's acting as much as others, but she did look completely bewitching. Such a unique face. Well, that, was, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, that, that image of her rising out of the bath for the yeah. first time in the blue is, considering it's, I mean, I tried watching Countess Dracula. It's rubbish. Um, again, <laughs> recently. Well, it's just like, it's, it's just like a very average sort of historical drama. Mm. So it's not, it's not very hammer. It's not very horror. No. Um, you know, maybe if you thought it was, oh, this is a, you know, made for TV melodrama about, you know, vaguely based on Elizabeth Bathory or whatever, you might be able to accept it a bit more. But when you approach it from the sort of through a hammer horror lens, mm. it's very disappointing. Um, but it's amazing how uh, on the basis of that film and, um, and uh, vampire lovers, how Ingrid Pitt has become almost, I think, for in 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 popular culture, mm. probably the you know the the name that you associate with Hammer Horror, despite only doing those two films. Two films, and I mean, of course, it helps that she did The Wicker Man and The House of Drip Blood, because people think of those as Hammer Horrors if if they're not yeah. sort of fans who know about the history of these things. People do tend to lump all these, which is another thing I'm you know i'd love to explore sometime is how the term hammer horror is used these days i've noticed that it's still on twitter as well it's still very much used in like political discussions mm. the number of times you get you post something of a picture of a, of a hammer horror monster and you know someone will come and say oh that's jacob reese mogg or <laughs> usually a tory i have to say i'm not being biased but usually someone will say jacob reese mogg or boris johnson or, or people will react to a photo by saying, oh, that looks like something out of a Hammer Horror. And of course, you look at it, if you're if you're a hardcore Hammer fan, you think that's nothing like Hammer Horror. Mm. But what they mean is that's like a, looks like something out of an old horror movie. And Hammer Horror has become this catch-all term. It's, well, that, it's let odd. me just, I just want to pick up on the last of these comments mm. here, and then I'll come back to Ingrid in a second. Um, so Holger says Ingrid was such an amazing character. Brandon Gant uh, says Harley Monroe is absolutely smashing. She's a sweet lady. Mm. Hal says if only Jane Seymour had appeared in one, that would have been amazing. Uh, yeah, she didn't do it. Well, well, she was in Frankenstein, The True Story, which I have to say is one of those films is that, that has a, hammer, a real, real hammer feel. I'm sorry? Is that a hammer, David? I don't think it is. No. <laughs> <laughs> don't be getting smart with me. It's one of those films that you uh, that has a real hammer feel, has a hammer vibe. Um, we've Me. got somebody, somebody else here who I don't think commented before. Darren Buffoy uh, says, hello, uh, I'm, Hi, another fan. I'm another fan of The Witches. I like the fact that horror, the horror isn't so obvious. It's more folk horror, like The Wicker Man. It and is. the scene near the end of the film is unsettling. Uh, he also says, the devil, Devil's Rides Out, Dracula 58, mm. and Brides of Dracula and Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed are some of my favourite hammer horrors. Um, good taste. Uh, Hal's talking about, uh, says, if it's good enough for Kate Bush to make a song about um yes her, her hammer horror song is not actually about hammer horror but that's a whole other no it's do you know what it's about because i know i know sir Can I, yes i but, know what it's about yes but i feel that 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 ties into something else that we might be doing so i, I kind of so, oh okay yeah it does okay. it's david it's, it's not, on the, it's, it's on the list horror. if you actually check the playlist that i sent you um oh was it yeah uh was I supposed Matt, to prepare for this? Matt, Sorry. not for this, something else. Matt says Ingrid was a fantastic self-promoter, and I think that's probably part of the reason why she got that reputation. Also, during the 80s and 90s, Ingrid made herself uh, readily available to Roy Skeggs and, and the Hammer people. <laughs> not not in that way. <laughs> but what a way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, whenever it Did came down to sound right, I'm when sorry. it comes down to doing publicity and stuff like that, Ingrid was available in a way that yeah. I think other people weren't. Um, so she kept a relationship with them, and I, th I think that makes all the, all the difference. Uh, Tony Sullivan says Norma Marla was the first girl to be put under contract by Hammer. That's I didn't know that, but yeah, that's that's the one I was thinking of. I think I got a name right, didn't I? I, said I, I, and, I did it. Yeah. That's that's the one I did the thread about for the mummy, wasn't it? Not that long ago. Oh, that's right. She did some promotion. Yeah, she did a, a yeah, tour yeah, of the yeah. US yes. promoting the mummy. That was the I, year before Doctor Jekyll. Yeah, I, I I did a thread about. It. I'll repost up on on the exclusive mm. PhD Twitter tonight. Um, just for if you're interested, Tony. Uh, yeah. So um, let us go to if you could remake a Hammer film today, which one would it be and why? Because that's a good Hammer question. Ooh. Oh, well, I, 
I haven't thought lots about this. So probably my, my initial thoughts are going to be sort of quite the obvious ones. I know everyone says The Devil Rides Out because, you know, Christopher Lee always wanted to remake it and, you know, Joe Dante wanted to remake it for years and nothing came of it. But it's all about the, you know, oh, what you, what you could do with the special effects. Mm. I, I think... I think the most exciting ones to me would be those ones with those strong characters in because the Duke de Richelieu was such a strong character. And I think that can hold together a, a film. So I think I would be quite eager to see the, the drama of a remake, but also I think that I think a lot of the Nigel Neal ones, because yeah. it, just because they have such strong characters and strong themes and they're so intelligent, I'd like to see what a really good writer and a, and a really good production team could do with something like along the lines of, you know, Quatermass or Quatermass in the Pit or whatever. Yeah, I think, I think Devil Rides Out would be might be more problematic now because Wheatley's not. I mean, there are issues about some of Wheatley's writing, which might make mm. that less favourable to to a modern audience. Um, I would think. Um, I, I mean, I'm with you on the Nigel Neal stuff, and Quatermass is the one property that Hammer has returned to time and time again. I know that they, they announced a, a remake of The Abominable Snowman not that long ago that doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. Mm. Um, but Quatermass has good series potential too, uh, and, and I imagine that X the Unknown would then be remade as part of a Quatermass series. Um, I think I think of those early science fiction films. Mm. I think I, I've actually come to prefer X the Unknown above the above the Quaid Mass films. I, it's Dean Jagger is is just much more palatable than. Uh, I, I don't like Brian Don Levy. Really. No, he's, or he's Don Levy or however you pronounce he's it. He's a bit harsh. Um, he is, I, and do you know, do you know the funny thing? Um, it's going back to you know we were talking about John Elder and or Anthony Hines and his mm. his scripts and his poor dialogue. I was watching Quaid Mass in the Pit a few weeks ago or a few months ago now and I, I'd like to think Nigel Neal didn't write this line of dialogue maybe the, maybe one of the actors made it up or something but there's this line where Andrew Keir says he gets on the phone and he says I think it's time to bring down the video stuff so that we can do the video thing and it's a, it's a really awful line of dialogue the sort of thing that you know if you didn't know anything about science you would you would make up to put in a really bad science fiction film I, I, I really hope to God um, Nigel Neal didn't write that because <laughs> my my idea of him has has plummeted. I can't I can't imagine it. Um, I don't know what I would like to see remade. Uh, um, Stolen Face top pops up every now and then as a as a possible. Uh, as does Taste of Fear, and both of those might be kind of curious. I mean, mm. can you imagine though the the lengths they'd have to go to to try, try and introduce a new twist for the for the netflix generation well still i think still in face to be quite good especially if you did it as a period drama um mm. you know it, with its sort of proto frankenstein things i don't know captain kronos was the other one that we all wanted to see as a series and it's been across hammer's desk as a possible remake multiple times it just never seems to happen well there's this thing there's this netflix series called the witcher which i've heard very good things mm. about it's not that that's the same type of concept isn't it I don't know anything about it. I just know that other, other friends are watching it. And Well, it's just kind of a, I think I'm, if it's a show I'm thinking of with um, Henry something or other, good looking chap, always supposed to be the next Bond, but he never gets to do it. Hell, Henry Cavill, you, you still Henry haven't told Cavill. us who your hammer hunk is, David. Oh. Um, You've managed well, to dodge well, that bullet, apart from pointing Oliver okay. Reed's nipples. Well, of course, Oliver Reed's nipples in in that scene where he wakes up in, in his own bed um, unexpectedly in mm. Curse of the Werewolf. There, there are no nipples like it. Um, but also, I've been salivating this week over um, Shandor Ellis from yeah. The Evil of Frankenstein yes. and um, Countess Dracula. And um, I, it was actually after finding a a portrait that's in the National Portrait Gallery. I don't mm. know if it's uh, I don't know if it's in the archives or it's sort of hang, hanging. Like, yeah. um, but he just looks utterly beautiful in it. Um, and he wasn't in, I don't think he was, I mean, he was in Crossroads. Everyone remembers him from that. One, of course, has And Soon the Darkness. Yeah. Mm, but I think is, he was only in the two Hammer films and maybe he was in one of the TV shows as well. Yeah, um, he did. He did a Hammer, he did Checkmate for Hammer House of Mystery and Suspense. That was it, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, Sandor Ellis. Uh, but I, see, I don't feel that Hammer were really catering for um, 
well, uh, see, I think I, I think straight women and gay men th- seem to have different tastes. Now, I know a lot of women on like on Twitter who who go absolutely gaga over Peter Cushing and Vincent Price and Christopher Lee. Hmm. Now, Christopher Lee, I have to say, in the original Dracula, he was he was quite a dish. There's some some shots that capture him in profile. The one I've used actually on the um, mm-hmm. on the publicity for this little chit chat tonight, and he's absolutely beautiful. He's so handsome. Uh, but generally, I, I feel like, um, you know, they were more sort of dashing and, uh, you know, rather than sexy. I, I'm not sure there were that many hammer males that I thought for. Uh, no, they don't Michael seem to. Ripper, f- but yeah, <laughs> they don't seem to cater for it in quite the same way. Um, but that, that that's something another project of of yours and mine, isn't it? Um, this. Yeah, um, a, a, an interesting thing because we we had this discussion earlier in the week about you know whether sort of Hammer had been done to death now in terms of was there was there anything left to discuss um, because obviously you're you're absolutely dying to sort of tell the world about exclusive and um, and 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 all the things they did outside outside horror mm-hmm. um, and outside film. In fact, there's, mm-hmm. there's so much to be said about. Uh, Will Hammer's other ventures and the stuff that Enrique Ooh, I, Guerreras did, and I should I should do a little uh, screen share at that point because I've I've got a oh do uh, yeah I've got an appropriate image for that one. Ooh. There we go. Oh, this is um oh okay so these are some of Will Hammer's stage shows. The, the, well, this is this is my colle- this is part of my collection of random Will Hammer stuff. Um, so there's mm-hmm. a bunch of stage shows. Uh, water park shows, um, and then stuff from his cycling days, from the Will Hi- from the the Heinz cycling shops, also the Heinz jewelers, um, and then there's actually I've got a program there from Will Hammer's actual solo routines, the Myth Merchant Will Hammer at the bottom, um, which I came across completely by accident, and then to the right of that, you can just about make out is a cast photograph from the public life of Henry the Ninth, the first ever Hammer film. Oh, and we've got ah, some sheet right. music as well. So, I mean, like, there's a lot more than just films, and uh, there's, there's a lot more than lot. just horror. And, and, um, yeah, do you know any singers, perhaps with a beautiful tenor voice, who would uh, maybe take on some of those old? If only songs? I could think of some musicians and singers, la, 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 and la, la, uh, la. you know, it would be a fun. I mean, it's 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 a project that I want to do. Um, that there's a yeah. couple of things I want to do in relation to sort of the expanding our knowledge of of, mm. of sort of the Hammer brand. Yeah. Um, I've done a couple of conference papers before where I've talked about Hammer being much more, um, and it, it, it's something that gets me interested. I'm just aware we've, we've talked for quite a bit, and I should probably read some more comments here. Mm, do. Um, so let me go through. Um, Matt has suggested he likes the idea of doing Plague of the Zombies as a remake, as a who done it with the zombies as a shock ending. Um, and obviously then you'd have mm. to rename it because you can't call it Plague of the Zombies and have zombies as a shock ending. Hmm. I'll let you think about that one for a second. Uh, Penny Goodman says she saw The Devil Rides Out on the big screen a few years ago and actually found the special effects work quite well in that context. It was the way the Angel of Death's horse reared over you. Yeah, imagine mm. that on a big screen, these films actually take on a much... I remember reading years ago about someone where it suggested that you there's an autumn position in the cinema where the screen like takes over you and then you see it in a different way. And I've, I've since then, that's where I try and sit in a cinema screen. She's usually about four rows back in the middle. People I've who never sit back. I don't understand. I've never had an issue with the the effects in the Devil Rides Out. Um, it, it's never bothered me. Mm. In fact, the only bit that ever bothered me was that one little bit near the beginning with, that they fixed, where the they used a matte painting, yeah, to go on top of the for the observatory on top of the house, and it was always like off kilter and it looked looked really bad. And I actually quite like that they've made that nice now. But that's not even that's not even a you know a horror effect no um all, all the rest of the stuff i i mean different too brandon gantt says i think hammer has bred some interesting characters that could launch some fantastic tv series like chronos it would be nice if hammer hooked up with a streamer like netflix i'd be surprised if those conversations aren't happening um and i think it's probably only a matter of time before somebody commits to it and andrew Keir's father shandor as well from dracula Prince yeah of well i know i know i think that. he'd make a fantastic character in a series yeah um played by somebody else obviously uh, yeah, I don't think Andrew's up for it. If, if only I knew someone who had a beard and liked praying priests. 
Um, yeah, let's how- do it. <laughs> also, Penny absolutely Spider may not be fab, but the horse is legit terrifying. Uh, Darren Buffoy says, I also remember when the 90s, the Hammer Horror magazine came out. They talked even then about remaking Devil Rides Out. Imagine what they could do with the effects. Yeah, at that point, there was a deal with Richard Donner and Warner Brothers and that, that fell apart very, very, very quickly. Um, but that was the the big film that they were talking about. I have an old Empire magazine somewhere where Chris Lee's on record as talking about doing it um matt singing praises of queer mass in the pit tells you to behave uh phil aubard would like a remake of the two faces of dr jekyll modernizing its inverted worldview and changing the end to let hyde go free Ooh. Ooh, and also the vampire lovers giving a more thoughtful less salacious treatment of the material a bigger ending a grown-up drama horror um, well actually i mean that that's a good point because of course that, that's based on uh, Sheridan Le Fanu's gothic novel and mm. I'm not sure there's ever been a definitive adaptation of that so Van- maybe we're still waiting for the definitive Carmilla I think Vampire Lovers is pretty darn close to be fair um, so just to, just a shout out again there's some more praise for Henry Cavill uh, Holger is uh, shouting for a Captain Colonel series or a Father Shandor series and mm. Hal has said Damien Thomas wasn't bad looking and Shudder would leap onto that sooner than Netflix would even consider it. Um, so there you go. Mm-hmm. There's, there's a, that's our comments up to date. So thanks, folks, for, for sticking with us for the moment and chatting away. Um, where do we want to go? We're going to go back to sex and and gays, or are we going to talk about something else? Um, uh, uh, you decide. I'm, we're all over the map here with what with um, David sent me. A, David sent me a list. And he had it all kind of worked out. made a little list. But he's forgotten how a conversation with me works. Yeah. (laughs) Which is not in a straight line. Um, No. um, Let us talk. Do you want to talk about projects or do you want to talk about the the detective work that we do? Um, Maybe a little bit about projects since it's, well, it's 25 past 10 now. Okay. So we should just tease a little about where we're going now. There's obviously there's all, all kinds of options for, you know, different media that you can work in these days. Mm. Obviously, I've been doing a lot on Twitter, but I'm determined that all this stuff that I've been doing, because I do, I put an awful lot of research into into what I what I put on Twitter, um, and it's all stuff that I I think I'd like to, um, you know, expand into something that sort of lives beyond Twitter a little bit. Mm. So I don't know. I've been I've been a I've been a freelance writer and editor for what about 15 years now um so maybe it's time i actually uh, actually did some some hammer books and stuff but i am quite interested in uh looking at sort of new perspectives on things i'm very interested in the in the queer hammer angle because i think there's lots to explore um by the way if you if you are on twitter and you're not following uh, dr penny uh dr penny goodman i have uh, i have nicknamed her what did i call you the queen of hammer subtext because we have these um, uh, sort of tweet-alongs with the film crowd where we'll watch a Hammer Horror film on, on a Friday night, uh, on, usually on Talking Picks TV. And, um, and yeah, uh, Dr. Penny Goodman has these wonderful observations. Um, and there's so much on a sort of queer level to do with sexuality, to do with gender, to do with all these different things that is still waiting to be explored and talked about. I find it fascinating. So maybe I'll do something with the Queer Hammer thing. I'm quite interested in sort of the music side of things. There's so many byways and side roads to go down with that. Strange love. <laughs> da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. I actually, I, I tried to um, prepare a little version of that to sing tonight, and you'll be glad to hear uh, it didn't work out. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Oh. Um, so, so yeah, so that, so they're just and of course i'm i'm absolutely obsessed with with bray studios but wayne wayne kinsey is doing a lot of that work for me at the moment um but i have to say i'm if you think wayne kinsey is fanatical about about the minutiae of of bray studios i mean i'm at the point where i'm you know making lists of what tree sits where and what type of tree it is so i can go back through the films and say oh this is where they film this and that i'm just i'm obsessed it, it um I've told you yeah. this, David. I mean, this is this is one of the things I'm finding weird about our the direction our friendship has has gone in recently with this because my friend, my late friend Robert Lane, um, who had done a lot of work on cataloging Bernard Robinson's collection, mm. and this is what's happened to that now. And I helped him do that, but he was a bit like you; he was very obsessive about the sets 
And I remember going into Bray with him and then doing what you're doing and pointing to the trees <laughs> and trying to work out something and say, we ain't got this bit wrong. It should be there. And I'm just like... <laughs> and I, I just like, admit, oh. Well, the thing is... Um, well, the thing is with Wayne, I mean, he, he's, his, his research is meticulous and obviously he, get, he goes to the locations and the and Bray and all this and maps it all out and stuff like that. Um, and obviously he's, he's changed his opinion on some things as the books have gone on. And by the way, if, if Wayne Kinsey brings out a new book and you can afford it, and I appreciate not everyone can afford to buy bo- lots of books. I, I, I don't have them all because I, I just don't have a lot of, you know, uh, Mm. Uh, disposable income to, to spend on lots of expensive books but if you can afford them get them when they come out because they become very collectible um and then people start trying to sell them at ridiculous prices once once they're sold out mm-hmm. but he goes into great detail about about you know the mechanics of bray and elstree and what was filmed where and all that sort of stuff and of course he, he changes his mind over the books because he'll discover new information or whatever mm. um and i think this is the thing we we quite often we put this in our list about sort of doing the detective work mm. of, um, of of looking into Hammer films, and it is very much like detective work. And you, and quite often I'll tweet something, uh, and then I'll go back on it a few tweets later and say, "Oh no, actually, I'm, I'm changing my mind about this. I think actually this is the case, or actually I found this new piece of evidence, and I think maybe this mm. is the case." Um, we do, <sighs> yeah. I was, almost, I was going to get onto another subject then. But oh, I, I know you are. I, I, can, really, I can feel it. I can feel I, it coming. I, don't really I know. Want to get onto that? No, not tonight. Actually, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not dying to get onto that subject. No, but I, I mean, I think um, research is something that always evolves, and you know, we we everyone who researches this stuff builds upon the work that was done before them, mm-hmm. and they hopefully add something of their own into it. They interpret information differently, and hopefully, you can find something new. I mean, you're doing it with the stuff that you're doing. Some of the stuff you're doing on your Hammer Gothic feed. I mean. You know that it's not all my bag, um, but some of it definitely is my no, bag. And, and, yeah, and, and I mean, and I vice versa. That, <laughs> yeah, and, and I know that not everyone is interested in it. Sometimes I'll put like the most recent thing I've been doing is I, I was watching Dracula: Prince of Darkness, and I spotted spotted stage three in the background. I don't think anyone's ever noted that before, or no. not that I've ever read. I, so I went absolutely ape shit over it. Oh my god, I spotted sp- stage three. And then I was watching the camp on Blood Island uh, today. And 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 that was filmed while stage three was was being erected, and and I spotted it in the background. And I thought no one's ever no one's ever noticed that. Well, no one's ever said. No one's mm-hmm. ever put it in writing. Now you know I probably got like you know six or seven people you know interacted with that by liking it or responding or whatever. I'm I'm aware that not everyone shares my obsession with the details, no. but but this is this is what's fun, um, you know about about fandom. Um, you know, I I just put it out there, and if if three people um, get as excited as I do about a, a little discovery, then that's you know three more than there were. So um, let let me run through the the last bunch of comments here, and mm-hmm. then add in what I'm up to um, and uh, some of our shared things. So uh, Hogger says, "Did you manage to speak for one and a half hours about Hammer and not mention Peter Cushing, or did I miss that? I think we mentioned him like in passing briefly once." Um, yes, I think we have achieved that rare thing. It's like, I mean, to be fair, nobody's commented on it yet. Um, I wrote a book about the Wicker Man, Ooh, and it, which I just, is very good. And I don't mention folk horror once, and nobody seems oh, really? to pick up on that. No, you look for that. that it's not wow. in the. It's not in the book. Um, because the you, you, because you got me, because you got me to proofread it, and I removed every reference to folk that's, horror. That's it. I said, uh, "What the hell are you doing, pandering <laughs> to these populists?" Remove that word at once. Um, Darren asks, did anyone love Let Me In? I thought it was an excellent remake. Uh, I think it's mm. just as good as Thomas, Thomas Alfredson's original film, but different enough to stand its own. The book was brilliant. Loved the book, loved the film. Um, it was just a case of bad timing. I don't think anyone expected the Swedish version to become the big international hit that it was. So people had seen the original, and that's what, what damaged that, that one's success. It was very good. Um, Penny says that was at Queen of Hammer subtext. I should put that in my bio, really. And you should follow it. Penny. Um, Penny wants to see you do a queer hammer project, David. So much scope yeah. there. Good. Um, I've been uh, we've been talking about this for such a long time. I hope it does happen. Uh, Matt asks, says it's been very enjoyable. Why don't you do a proper podcast on Hammer? There are a few out there. 
He says they're not great. Um, I'm I'm not willing to comment on anybody else's podcast because I the Sydney Punk have one. Um, and goodness is what people think of it. Uh, we have been talking about doing something more. Um, what form it takes as yet we're still discussing mm -hmm. but if you folks are interested or if other people are interested in, in seeing us do more throw us a line shout us let us know and um we'll see what we can we can make happen i think part of the thing as well is, is trying to make sure that we find our own voice within the spaces um because as more people are covering more of the stuff the last thing you want to do is to have you know the same podcast again with this you know doing the same stuff mm -hmm. um I just like the things that I, because I, one thing I try to do with my Hammer Gothic account is really just encourage anyone who, who I think is doing good stuff about, about Hammer. Um, and so I, I, I like to, you know, retweet other people and big them up if they're, if they're doing something. Now, a lot of these podcasts, I, I don't honestly don't have time to listen to them because mm. it's actually a big investment mm -hmm. listening to a, a podcast because it's, well, it's like, a, you know, it's like a, like trying to dis film. discourage people from listening to this, David. So, uh, well, obviously different with us. You know, I do recommend <laughs> you, you know, download this one, listen to it again and again, listen to it in your sleep um, while you're yep. out on the bus. Uh, but um, yeah, so I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, but I do encourage them because just the fact that they're, especially like, is it the Hammer, ha the Hammer House or House of Hammer podcast or whatever it is, the ones that are doing the exclusive films. I know, again, that's not everyone's bag, but it's people talking about the films and it's stuff that not many people have talked about before. So mm. I really encourage them in that. I've, I've listened to bits. It's great what I've heard. Um, but I, after I admit, I haven't listened to the whole things, but then, you know, I don't, I don't expect everyone to tune into, to my stuff. It's, um, well, I believe they're doing man and black this week, one. David. So you might want to listen to that one. Yeah, I probably should. <laughs> it, it's, it's a good one. It's a good one. But I mean, there is there is stuff out there for literally everybody. I mean, of whatever mm. your kind. I mean, it, it's such a weird to see the, the the way things have changed over the last decade. But whatever your realm of fandom is, mm. it seems that there is a content there for you. Um, it seems that there there are different voices. There are, there are academics. There are uh, just fans. There are people who want to go and watch the films and get pissed. You know, whatever your bag is, like go ahead and do it. I think as long Ham as you can... hammered, ham hammered. With I, Hammer, is it? I can't remember which, so, what the yeah. titles are of them all because they all have the name Hammer in them and it's got confusing yeah. to me. Um, you know, so it, it, there, there's such great scope. Um, and, I, you know, hopefully Dave and I can find our way through. We, we, we have a couple of projects that we've been talking about doing. Um, just because if I don't encourage this publicly, David will find a way of backing out of it. But we are trying to look at doing a live show um, or possibly two different projects. I'm, I'm committed there. now um so we'd really like to do it everyone. the sort of thing that we'll be able to take to like small theaters and venues and stuff and um basically have a chat and sort of just share our love but again we've got some niche stuff that that hasn't really uh, been talked and, about yeah and by the way we both we both well i was going to say we both act and sing robert acts i act and sing yeah so so who knows the scope for all kinds Ooh, imagine that acting and singing david wonder what what we might have in mind <laughs> <laughs> hmm. uh, Re yeah. Remake of Lust for a Vampire, me as Mikala. Strange love. No. <sighs> I'm getting you a candlestick. <laughs> um, so it, uh, Andy's very keen on the Queer Hammer, and Darren also says Queer Hammer sounds great. Uh, with Penny, I can tell Robert's not even looking at the screen. I'm, I'm trying to ignore you. Uh, Hammer films are great for everyone. It's nice to see such a great mix of people love Hammer films. Hal asks where we would do the live show. That's something we have to talk about with venues uh, and places. So I mean, if you know a venue that might be up for having uh, venues and cinema, cinemas, theaters, um, town halls, sorts of stuff like that, libraries, you know, wherever will take us. Um, we're going to see if we can. I'm, I'm going to see if we can get maybe a test one or two done, and then I have some venues earmarked that I would love us to be able to play for very nerdy hammer reasons. And anyone who follows our feeds may eventually pick up on clues, but we'll we'll see what happens. Um, Matt says if you don't do don't go down the podcast route, do more of these, and he'll publicize the hell out of them. And the hammer lovers, <laughs> thl word. Um, if if you don't, if you happen to be one of the five people on the planet who likes Hammer films who isn't uh, into the Hammer Lovers group on Facebook, you should give it a follow too. Um, it's it's well worth doing it. There's lots of lots of interesting people in there and some some good pictures too. Um, and you get to meet all the people that Matt meets, which is yeah. 
all the all the hammer babes all, all the hammer babes yeah um so yeah, that's always good um, and i have to say i i mean I, there's a few people I, i'd i'd like to you know big up tonight I, I mean do follow obviously go check out matt's group do follow um holger as well holger's always got an interesting observation the thing about holger is holger hasser he's on twitter and he's on facebook and um the thing about holger is he he likes some of the films that no one else likes i, I think he was championing championing the the vengeance of she um which i have to say uh, is is a film i've you know i've got a bit of time for um follow penny goodman as well yeah queen of hammer subtext um hal sinden who's here tonight Mm-hmm. Shout out to Hal. Um, Hal's asking, yeah. surely we could look he, at hiring an indie cinema. And he has, <laughs> yeah. Um, and Hal has a very famous grandfather, Hal, Hal Sinden's famous grandfather, you can guess from the surname. Uh, and Hal always has interesting observations about cinematography and that kind of thing. Um, and there was someone, oh yeah, Andy Ellis with his locations work, Hammer Locations, on mostly on Facebook. I don't think you're on Twitter, are you, Andy? But uh, yeah, it's. It, I think it's really exciting to have... Um, so many people that i know from twitter and from facebook um all coming together for this conversation tonight and um you all have unique gifts and unique treasures <laughs> to give to the world of hammer do 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 are you are you are you are you're doing the, you're doing the world of hammer aren't you i'm, the, I'm the, so the glad you recognized yeah. it because well, i thought that was just gonna go I mean, just because you've mentioned Holger, I mean, you know, Holger and I did the trail up to Holly Reed's grave in in, in County Cork together. Um, seeing as Ollie has been Ollie. a Ollie has been a thread tonight, so yeah, me, me and me and Holger went to have a look at the grave, and even and Ollie's have nipples a got a mention. So yes. I have to. I mean, Ollie is someone I love to talk about at some other point because he's such a problematic individual, but also I love his work as an actor. It's it's I feel conflicted. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So yes, folks, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Mm, uh, if lovely. you don't already i've hopefully the the things worked in the things but um david you'll get on twitter at hammer gothic or at david l Rattigan. um you can get me at avalard that's a-v-a-l-a-r-d or at uh exclusive phd and that's all the, where i keep all my hammer research and also you've got cinepunked.com this has been a cinepunked event for tonight um which is my other little organization that, that we we do filmy stuff of and hopefully this is the first in a series of conversations with filmy fans uh dave and i will probably do more of this stuff but probably under our own brand and uh there's some karloff karloff does count in terms of hammer you know david um does he he does. If uh, when my exclusive book comes out, uh, hopefully later on this year, you will find out exactly how Karloff counts Ooh. as Hammer. Um, so that that's that's the thing I'm working on at the moment. I'm doing my big book on exclusive. It is largely written. Um, there's a massive, massive list in there. So I, I want to try right, and get right. it out in the next couple of months. Brilliant. Um, Looking forward to it. Last couple of questions. Let me see. Uh, Darren. So Penny says Andy's location shoots are incredible. Love them. Holger's blushing. Um, oh. Holger, Holger, aka Thorley Walters. <laughs> he is, isn't he? Uh, Darren says Hammer films should never be forgotten. They're a big part of the British film industry. One of the most successful film studios ever to come out of Britain. Mm-hmm. Um, Andy says thanks to mention, and no, he's not on Twitter. He's just on Facebook. Um, Matt says Ollie Reed was the greatest Bond who never was. Uh, Phil says thank you. Appreciate you both on Twitter very much. Thanks, Phil. Uh, we appreciate you. Appreciate everyone. Uh, and David and Andy as well. And uh, Penny says thanks so much for good evening, guys. Look forward to more. Darren says I've been a fan since I was nine or ten years old. I'm now 38. You're wow, young, young whippersnapper, you. Uh, you guys have been well. Thank you so much for doing this live video and cheers from Matt. So thank, thank you, you guys. Really appreciate the interaction. Um, we'll we'll get one of these sorted out soon. We'll we'll talk about something else. And if you've stuff that you would like us to talk about. Let us know. Drop us a line on, on Twitter or Facebook and we will we will have a look at. Uh, Holger, are you saying that you look like Franco Nero or that you want us to talk about Franco Nero? <laughs> I think I can't. I don't think I'm going to be able to do Franco Nero as a love, conversation. Love child of Franco <laughs> Nero and Thorley Walters. <laughs> um, anything you want to say to finish up, Dave? Um, no, just please keep um, in, uh, interacting on on Twitter and stuff, and I will be I will be doing a bit more with Hammer Gothic on Facebook, but not a great deal. I kind of like the Twitter medium and the conversations it, it it inspires, but I really do appreciate just everyone you know sharing their observations and opinions and things like that. I do I do occasionally tease that people have the wrong opinion or whatever. Um, not everyone can be correct as often as I am. I appreciate that. 
<laughs> no, I do often te- tease people, but uh, you know, tease my friends. But uh, honestly, I, I, I value um, you know every, everyone's observations, and and I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't be content if I were just putting out tweets and people weren't interacting or questioning or commenting or 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 whatever because it's the interaction that that really makes it. And um, we've got a, there's a good little community on Twitter. It's it's, it's it's amazing. I mean, I I'm 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 delighted with with the interactions and the interactions you get, David, because I know you kind of have walked away as well for quite a while from the hammerishness. Of yeah, I did a little bit of Facebook, but I, but I've not really it's not really been part of my sort of you know writing and research tra- trajectory since the diabolique days so yeah that's a conversation around it um just a bunch more thank yous and 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 congratulations from darren and hal and holger and kareem brown who was quiet for the rest of it says thanks so much for this uh, event i've loved it um so thank you kareem uh andy wants us to do more uh holger is going to be haunted by thoroughly walters until his grave brandon gant says thank you guys lovely discussion uh, Darren wants to do one of Andy's locations. Um, he knows I do at some point. He's heard great things. And Crean says, please do more on YouTube. And Tony Sullivan, uh, thank you, Tony, says, good show and has done a really cute, uh, looks like a b- vampire bat emoji thing, um, which I'll screenshot for I'll you. Take that. Oh, well, I can see it. Oh, can you see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were on the chat or not. I've been slagging I, off I've the whole got, way through. Yeah, I'm flipping between the. Uh... The things. Shit, I have to delete all my messages now because David's poor, gone. Poor, I've poor, just been mocking him. Poor, poor Thorley. Poor Thorley Walters is um, a bit. Um, he think he thinks that the Holger Hasse comparison is going to haunt him to the grave. Oh, sorry, that is Holger Hasse. Sorry, <laughs> the um, I don't mind. Yeah, thanks everyone. It's it's been good. Okay, folks, thank you. Um, I'm gonna log us off now um but if you're interested in more follow us on twitter and check out cinepunk.com for those of you who are into your classic horror films uh we've just pushed up another podcast today on cinepunk about the 1968 peter bogdanovich film targets with boris karloff um you might enjoy that too just to show that there's there's more in the world than just Hammer. did i did i say you could plug this it's 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 my brand to show david <laughs> okay <laughs> Uh, okay, folks, uh, thanks again, and um, we're just going to log off and you'll be left with a, a fun screen. So if, you, if you've enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button as well on the channel. It means you'll get notifications whenever we've got other stuff happening. Goodbye, goodbye, <laughs> we're leaving you, goodbye, goodbye.